Good morning, everyone. Sorry about the technical glitch. Hola a todos. En nombre de la Asociación OTAN de Canadá, me complace dar la bienvenida al embajador de España en Canadá, excelentísimo señor Enrique Ruiz Molero, para nuestra discusión especial de hoy. My name is Tina Park, and I'm the Vice President of the NATO Association of Canada and Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, based at the University of Toronto. On behalf of everyone at the NATO Association of Canada, I am delighted to welcome you to today's discussion featuring the very distinguished Spanish Ambassador to Canada, His Excellency Enrique Luis Molero. The NATO Association of Canada is a nonprofit organization with the central mandate of educating Canadians on the importance of NATO in promoting international peace and security, particularly Canada's role in maintaining the rules-based order with their allies and protecting our key values. Today's discussion with Ambassador Molero is part of our series, which examines the future of the Alliance as we cope with the new threats and challenges. From dealing with the COVID-19 global pandemic, to the rise of extremism, to refugees and migrants, as well as climate change and cybersecurity, Canada and Spain face many common challenges. We have the rare opportunity today to hear directly from Ambassador Molero for his candid views and insights. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Eric Jackson, who is one of our brilliant interns at the NATO Association of Canada. I will turn it over to him to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you, Dr. Park. My name is Eric Jackson. I am the program editor for Canada's NATO and ambassador coordinator at the NATO Association of Canada. We are so honored to be joined today by His Ex Excellency Enrique Reyes Molero, the ambassador of Spain to Canada. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and thank you very much, Dr. Parker. Um, I am very pleased and very honored to, uh, of being here with you today, of uh, having had your invitation. And this gives me an opportunity also to reach uh, all the friends of the NATO Association uh, of Canada. So um, if, uh, if you would uh, like me to, to proceed, uh, my idea was um, to say some, uh, we have, I have prepared some notes about the relations of Canada and Spain today. And um, uh, they touch several points that I think would be of interest of, of your um, public, of your members of the mm -hmm. association, which are the political uh, relations between Spain and Canada, also economic relations, uh, cultural relations, and um, all the things that interest our societies, both Spanish and Canadian, and uh, make them closer to each other. So on the political side, I would say that we are both uh, allied countries, uh, very advanced democratic societies, members of the most important world organizations, NATO, the European um, Association for Security and Cooperation, the, um, the OCDE, the G20, and so many other international bodies. Here, we, we our policies, are inspired by similar values, similar criteria and objectives. And we are definitely countries that are attached to a rule-based international system. This affinity between our two countries is translating into a succession of joint initiatives. Um, in different organizations and multilateral uh, sectors. I would say that the priorities that we share right now, Canada and Spain, are the implementation of actions to fulfill the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, 
in particular to achieve full gender equality and empowerment of women and girls, the protection of the environment and the need to fight climate change, the protection of the oceans, and the willingness to comply with the Paris Agreement. In, um, in regard to the, um, to the political uh, life of the last few months, uh, I would like to point out that very recently, both countries have uh, cooperated in the field of the export of vaccines from Europe to Canada. This is a subject that is new, but it is uh, of great uh, actuality today. And uh, we are glad to say that uh, Spain has a relevant participation in the production, packaging and shipping of the Moderna vaccine that is that Canada is receiving because uh, they, they, it's a Swiss company, but it is uh, the, the actual uh, expedition of the vaccine to Canada come, uh, is from Spain. There are other fields where you can uh, uh, see the solidarity between Spain and Canada is the the solidarity that Spain is exhibiting with Canada regarding the detention in China of uh, Drew Michaels. This is also a, a subject that uh, has clouded the relations between Canada and China and where we as an ally and as a friend are trying to uh, intervene on Canada's side. Another subject where uh, that uh, connected with this one is the declaration against arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations where we have participated and joined the Canadian initiative. Mm, so th these are just some examples about uh, recent initiatives that we have had, but there are many others. Uh, for example, uh, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Uh, Spain organized uh, uh, an event. Uh, of course, it was video uh, because of COVID, but uh, Prime Minister Trudeau participated in that event because we are both very interested in uh, um, celebrating uh, the anniversary of the United Nations and to have a strong multilateral uh, cooperation. Um, the feminist foreign policy is something, is an initiative that uh, also both countries have backed. Uh, a platform uh, recently created to help the refugees and displaced people from Central America. This is uh, something we have seen recently, those thousands of families, people traveling across Central America, crossing Mexico to reach the border with the United States. It's a dramatic reality where both countries are also trying to, to, to help. Another initiative would be uh, this one, a Canadian initiative, the Coalition for Media Freedom. This is very important that uh, journalists and media all over the world can, can uh, speak freely uh, in a world where we see so many uh, powers uh, uh, not liking this uh, media freedom. Another common initiative is the International Conference 
uh, of donors in solidarity with Venezuelan refugees and migrants. This is also vital for, for both uh, countries. Then other issues more connected with NATO that I think would be in your interest is pointing out that we have an excellent cooperation within NATO. Um, not only the military cooperation, but the one based in industrial and technological interests. Uh, from the strictly military point of view, um, we have uh, troops and armored vehicles uh, deployed in Latvia under uh, Canadian uh, leadership in NATO's enhanced forward presence. We also uh, cooperate in this, um, this cooperation, I said before, technological. Uh, a proof of it is that um, Airbus, which is European and includes four European countries, among them Spain, uh, Airbus Spain is building for Canada, for the Canadian Air Force, uh, 16 C-295 airplanes. These are, are these naval surveillance, uh, search and rescue uh, planes that reach very remote regions. They are being uh, delivered since 2020 and 16 of them will uh, join your, your Air Force. There is cooperation in cybersecurity. There is mutual interest in the 5G network and making sure that uh, our 5G, when it's deployed, is uh, as secure as possible. Then I, I thought that I could uh, speak a few minutes about the economic and commercial relations between our two countries. Maybe the, the public in general doesn't know uh, much about it, but what I can say is that little by little in these last 10 years, or 15 years, uh, many Spanish companies have invested in Canada and uh, Canadian companies in Spain. I would say that the presence of Canadian companies in Spain is older and that the presence of uh, Spanish companies in Canada is more recent. Which are the fields that interest our companies? Well, one of them has been the petrochemical industry, and we have uh, investments of Repsol, which is the biggest uh, Spanish um, oil uh, producing company, and FIPSA, which is the second one. They, uh, FIPSA has invested in Quebec and, um, and uh, Repsol in New Brunswick in um, liquid uh, liquid gas plant and um, Repsol also in Talisman in Alberta. So, <clears throat> so um, this field is covered, but there are other um, fields like, for example, exploiting uh, highways. This uh, construction, maintenance and uh, of highways, uh, we have a great expertise in this field and uh, we are cooperating with the big uh, construction companies in, in Canada. There are investments in the textile uh, sector, which you know we, we are strong uh, and in many Canadian cities, you start to see Tara's stores and, and others that are less uh, known. On your side, of course, all the big uh, 
many of the big Canadian companies are present in Spain. Bombardier has been there for many years in the trains and uh, planes uh, fields. Um, Orvana Minerals, communications, telecommunications, Open Text, Colmarex Group. There are many companies uh, established in, in Spain, Canadian companies established in Spain. The trade has also grown a lot. And uh, to give you an example, in the last 10 years, say from 2007 to 2017, 10 years, trade has doubled. So for us that uh, we were late in the Canadian market because of course other European countries uh, had older relations with Canada, the United Kingdom, France, or even Germany or Italy uh, have bigger figures than us. But uh, I can say that in the last 10, 15 years, our trade has been doing very well. And we are near, near 2 billion uh, euro in both directions, imports and exports. It's a very balanced trade. So uh, both sides are, are very happy and it's increasing every year. I have to say that since the, the entry into force of the CETA agreement, um, we have profited from it and, and increased our, our exports uh, to Canada. So this field, I would say that is, has, has been of mutual, mutual uh, satisfaction for both sides. Uh, a little information about cultural, educational, and scientific relations. This field is more um, related to the universities. And uh, I think it will interest you also, uh, given the, the close links between the NATO Association of Canada University of Toronto, etc. Um, well, we have good, good um, between many Spanish universities and Canadian universities uh, exchanging students, and um, it's been going on for several years. And not only universities, but also uh, secondary education. There is a big number of uh, Spanish students that in their, uh, say, 10th, 11th or 12th grade, come to Canada to have an experience in, in, in your schools uh, for, for a course, for a whole academic year. The universities, there are several that have departments of uh, Spanish language and Spanish culture and uh, exchange of, of teachers. And um, well, this is a field where that we think that we can increase our cooperation in the future. There is an interest for the Spanish language. Uh, we are contributing with teachers and we hope this will increase in the coming years because uh, uh, your neighbors are the 20, 22 Latin American republics that speak Spanish. And uh, it's natural that there is a big interest in the Spanish language in, in Canada. In the field of scientific and, and technological relations, it's very new. Some agreements have been signed. Some projects, common projects, we have worked uh, together, but I would say it's a um, much newer field and that it needs development in the, in, the, in the next years. One thing that uh, this cultural field that uh, uh, brings together the people of Spain and 
Canada is uh, sports, sports. Uh, you know, uh, soccer is the Spanish national uh, sport. And in this field, uh, one very recent event last year was the creation of Atletico Ottawa. It's a soccer team, a soccer team of, of Ottawa, the capital city, sponsored by Atletico de Madrid, the, the team that won the Spanish league and that is playing in Canada's Premier League. Just to show you an example of uh, things that uh, get together our, our, our two peoples. And finally, uh, I would like to, to, to close my, my initial intervention by informing you that apart from the embassy in Ottawa, we have two consulates in Canada, one in Montreal and another one in Toronto. Our communities are not so big. We have uh, around 8,000 Spaniards in, in each city. Uh, Toronto and Montreal, and around 4,000 scattered all over all over the country, uh, mainly in Alberta and BC. So, um, apart from those consulates, we have uh, two commercial offices um, trying to promote trade and investment between the two countries and one tourism office, which is also very important in uh, the task of bringing together our two peoples. Uh, our tourism office promotes Spain as a touristic destination and uh, of course helps us very much in, in, uh, in our effort to make our country better known by the Canadian public. So I, I, I would stop here and uh, I am ready to, to, to answer any questions or themes that you would like to propose. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I wonder if we could begin by um, turning our attention to the latest developments with COVID-19. Uh, I'm sure you were watching the developments in Spain uh, very closely um, since the COVID-19 pandemic began more than a year ago. And I'm wondering if you could share with our audience uh, what kind of lessons we can uh, take away from Spain's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Yes, a, our experience has been... Um, similar, I would say, to the Italian one. We were the two first countries in Europe uh, attained by the disease, by the pandemic. And um, at the beginning, uh, we were so surprised and uh, uh, so very much caught uh, out of balance that we had a very uh, tragic uh, mortality among senior residents of um, homes for senior people. Uh, the mechanism of the virus was not well known the, um, these residences were not uh, well prepared and we had uh, an excessive mortality in, in this uh, bracket of people aged 70, 80 or more. In the next months, measures were, were, were put into place and um, Fortunately, the, the statistics improved and uh, the, um, 
the amount of uh, respirators, uh, the amount of beds in our hospitals was, was enough to, to, to attend the people, but still we have paid an enormous, an enormous price because uh, we, tens uh, of, of, of thousands of deaths, even if, okay, we are a country of 47 million, but still our, uh, our, the amount of people that have died, around 100,000, is uh, similar to our neighboring Italy, France, United Kingdom, but these countries have a bigger population than Spain, so we have suffered a lot. When the vaccines started to be distributed, we have played uh, an important role because there are several production centers of vaccines in the world. The United States is one, India is another one, Europe, European countries is another one, and um, several laboratories in Spain have connections both with Pfizer and Moderna and have been uh, manufacturing in, in Spain vaccines that have been exported to 30 or 40 countries in the world, one of them Canada. So here we were better prepared than other countries because in the past we haven't dismantled our pharmaceutical industry. We, we are a country with the capacity to produce vaccines. And um, fortunately, laboratories in, in Spain are contributing to this effort. And also there is local investigation. And right now there are three or four um, vaccines being developed in Spain that probably will reach the, the people in 2022. They are uh, of the two kinds that uh, you know about with, uh, the, with the messenger uh, like Moderna or Pfizer or with the virus uh, like the AstraZeneca vaccine of the two kinds, uh, Spanish scientists are developing. And like I said, we hope in 2022, we'll, we'll be able to put them in the market. Uh, I would also uh, like to say, because uh, after all, we are, um, you are the NATO Association of Canada, that the military have been very, very important in our fight against COVID. The, the military have been used by the government of Spain in so many tasks related with uh, COVID. Um, cleaning and disinfecting uh, hospitals, uh, homes for senior people, vaccinating people. So the military have contributed like many other uh, people, persons in the society, they have contributed even more uh, in, in our case. So it has been uh, fantastic uh, to show how well integrated our forces, our armed forces are with, with the people of Spain. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, on that note, let's turn our attention to the military. Uh, I understand that Spain is taking a leading role in NATO's exercise uh, formidable shield involving over uh, 3,000 uh, personnel from NATO countries. Could you perhaps enlighten our audience about uh, Spain's uh, very proud uh, naval tradition and some of the key contributions made to the alliance? 
Well, yeah, that's true. We have uh, a very big and old uh, naval tradition. Uh, after all, the first three ships that uh, discovered America uh, in 1492 came from Spain. And you know that from the 15th century on, uh, we have, uh, with the Portuguese especially, had uh, enormous fleets and a very big uh, naval uh, tradition. With the decline of the Spanish Empire, the, the naval tradition also declined. But we can say that in the last uh, 30, 40 years, after joining the common market, today the European Union, the Spanish naval industry was completely re rethought. And today we are the second uh, shipbuilder in Europe after the UK and the 10th in the world. So it is still very, very important industry in, in Spain and in Europe and uh, very specialized in uh, very specific types of ships, for example, for the oil extracting industry in, in the sea, for example, very advanced fishing ships, um, cruisers, of course, even if this industry has been severely touched by COVID, but uh, we hope it will recuperate soon. Um, military ships, of course, uh, pleasure ships. So we are satisfied with, with uh, the situation of naval construction in, in Spain today, even if, of course, we have to face the enormous competition coming from Asian countries. But still, in the military field, for example, um, we have this uh, several uh, very good platforms. One of them, the best uh, known, um, are the frigates that are participating, like you said, in this uh, NATO ex exercise, Formidable Shield. Uh, these are the frigates of the 100 class. These frigates have been all over the world in the, in the last years. Some countries like uh, Australia and um, Norway have the same design. It's a Spanish design, but it can be, the, the ship can have actually be built in Spain or be built somewhere else. It's basically the, the technology which, which is important. And uh, one of them, the Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon in Spanish, was here in Halifax in 2016. Um, and uh, so the Canadian public was able to, to see it and uh, it has participated with the other frigates of its class in many exercises, uh, NATO exercises, both in the Atlantic and in the Mediterranean. And we are uh, cooperating uh, with the US Navy um, and with the Canadian Navy in many of these exercises. In fact, this frigate was one of the finalists in the, um, in the tender for, for the Canadian future um, warship. But unfortunately, another design was chosen, but still ours was very, 
appreciated and like I said, it was a finalist because it's, it's one of the most modern designs in the world today. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, let's uh, finally turn our attention to a uh, last question from me, uh, which is on culture. So Ambassador, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I cannot think of many countries like Spain, which has such a beautiful mix of uh, nature, architecture, art, music, and history. Uh, and I was very fortunate to spend some time in Barcelona before the pandemic began, and I hope to return uh, as soon as we can travel again safely. What role does culture play in connecting people of Spain and Canada? And how can we use cultural education as a tool for promoting NATO's mandate? Thank you for the question, Dr. Park. A I, I think that um, what uh, we are doing, one of our tasks in, in the embassy is uh, trying to make Canadians more aware of our country, of Spain. And uh, there are several ways of doing this. And uh, today we have uh, new instruments like uh, the media and all the social, social media that help us enormously compared to the past to, to share news about our country, about what's going on in the different fields that interest the, the Canadian public. Spanish culture and Spanish uh, manifestations of, of, uh, of its culture traditionally have been present in the Canadian society, both through uh, government-sponsored initiatives, like, for example, when an official institution uh, sends an exhibition of paintings to a Canadian museum, or when uh, a Spanish institution finances uh, uh, an orchestra, for example, to, to come to perform to Canada. But also there, has, there have been private initiatives of Spanish artists that uh, have been promoted in, in Canada. So it's a, it's a field where both the private and the public can do a lot for it. In our case, I spoke before about the, um, our tourism office. We would like to, to that the Canadian people uh, forget a little about this idea that Spain is only sun and beaches. Uh, Spain is much more than that. And what we try to promote is a tourism based in cultural visits, visits to historical places where the visitor to our country can, can come back with a much richer uh, experience. And in this field, well, we try to, to see what interests more, uh, architecture, gastronomy, knowledge of wines and wine uh, territories. Uh, we have so many uh, different things to offer that um, that's what we are trying uh, to sell more than the, the sun and, and the beach. These things are present in uh, Spain's daily life. Even small cities, small towns have um, cultural events going on um, every day. So there is an interest in, 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 in these events, dance, music, uh, uh, film industry, of course, is also big in Spain. 
uh, uh, rock music, modern music, uh, classic music. All the manifestations of uh, culture, I would say, that are present and uh, oriented in uh, both to the Spanish public and to those visiting us, because you have to remember that Spain is one of the countries in the world that receives more visitors from all over the, the world. Of course, with the pandemic, the numbers have decreased, but in one or two years, we hope that uh, the situation will be uh, as it was. Absolutely, Ambassador, and, and thank you so much so far for the wonderful discussion, and thank you, Dr. Park, for, for, for moderating a, a really sort of elegant and, and insightful conversation about some sort of very important matters. Um, we'd like now to turn to our, our live Q&A session of the event, where uh, we'll be fielding questions from our live audience, and to our live audience on YouTube right now, please feel free to continue adding in questions, both in English or Spanish, if you prefer, and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to address as many as possible, because we are already having a number of very interesting questions coming in. Um, Ambassador, to your last point, I actually want to just sort of speak to the, the importance of sort of culture and the sharing of cultures between our communities. Uh, especially since that sort of really enhances our own security because when we're stronger together by sharing our culture, it means that we are able to sort of have this more unifying effect. Um, going back to sort of what you were saying about the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of questions we've been receiving from the audience pertain to that because it is such a such an in-our-face um, topic right now. What do you see or, or what do you suspect are the long-term implications and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the way that Spain and by extension, the European Union operate? Well, what our politicians have realized is that it, it is absolutely essential to keep and improve our capabilities in this field of pharmaceutical industry. Because we cannot depend like we were on China and India for, I don't know which percentage, but a very big percentage of the production of medicines in general. We, the Western countries, we must have the capacity to produce in our territories medicines and vaccines, even if we are more expensive. We have been caught with in, in a situation that was far from good, and uh, this cannot happen again. So I am convinced that many European countries, and we are one of them, are going to invest more in our pharmaceutical industries and in investigation. I said before that we have three or four vaccines being developed in Spain by different teams of scientists. And these teams need financing. They need to be backed by the government. And uh, we have to recuperate the capacity within the Western world to produce our own vaccines. This is far from ending. And um, after COVID-19, other viruses will come. So we have to be prepared. And uh, I think this is a field that we're open to cooperations between uh, different countries. We have realized 
the public didn't know this, but we have realized that, for example, Pfizer is American, but BioNTech is German. Uh, AstraZeneca, it's British and Swedish. Moderna is Swiss, but producing and cooperating with other European countries. Uh, Johnson and Johnson, again, American and European. Other vaccines that are coming uh, in the next few months will be uh, European produced. Uh, we, we, we cannot depend so much from uh, other countries and 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 uh, like uh, what happened in the first months of the pandemic that that's my point of view thank you ambassador I apologize i was on, I was on mute for a second uh, but thank you so much for that wonderful insight. I mean, it's, it is really important that we take the lessons from the pandemic and sort of move forward into a, a, a sort of more stronger and, and, and unified society, especially um, within the sphere of NATO, within the sphere of European Union and, their, and your North American allies. And, and particularly with the pandemic, one of the lessons we've learned is that there's this been rise of this sort of shadow pandemic, that being the disproportionate effect on, on women in diverse ways and, and minority populations. What has Spain been doing to protect women and minority populations from the negative effects uh, that are being highlighted during the pandemic? Well, I would say that um, the, those populations in uh, uh, underdeveloped countries where women and girls suffer more, uh, they will be specially reached by the COVAX uh, mechanism uh, to which we have contributed, like Canada has contributed very generously and that our, our efforts to help those populations uh, that suffer more because of the absence of vaccines in their countries will, will um, have uh, finally vaccines Thanks to the efforts of developed countries, members, like you said, of the European Union, members of NATO, uh, members, richer countries of the United Nations, through this mechanism is how we will contribute to uh, to help. Apart from these multilateral efforts, there can be specific direct uh, efforts to a certain country. Uh, but right now, we are contemplating the multilateral mechanism as the best way of helping all of them because there are so many countries in Africa, in Latin America, in, in Asia, lacking vaccines. And other countries uh, have already vaccinated already half of the population and uh, the inequalities are, are so big. So I hope that in the next months when the when the laboratories are producing at their full capacity, the COVAX mechanism will be able to supply more vaccines to these countries that uh, uh, where their population and especially women and girls are, are suffering more. Certainly. And it's very important then to sort of really highlight that multilateral sort of cooperation um, to achieve these sort of these really important goals of ours to really help um, uh, women and vulnerable populations and at risk populations, especially in underdeveloped countries. Um, turning over just to sort of a more broad question on the idea of multilateralism. 
and, and really sort of highlighting the, the ability of the European Union, for example, to create such a well-versed organization that has sort of harmonized currency and, and freedom of movement between countries. What lessons can the rest of the world take from the organization like the European Union and, and formulate some sort of other organization in their own sort of sphere of the world? Well, the, the European Union is, uh, is, uh, is a very special, very special organization. And uh, it started relatively small and uh, has become what it is today. So the only thing I can say for other organizations in the world is to, to persevere, to, to, to amplify the fields where, where they cooperate. We started with uh, carbon and, and steel and, and cooperating in those fields, six countries. And little by little, the number of countries grew and the fields of cooperation grew. And uh, then the political cooperation started. And it's, it's, it's the history of, of, uh, of, of many years of cooperation. There are areas in, in the world, for example, uh, Latin America, which is uh, uh, part of the world that has uh, traditional historic uh, links with Spain, where we have uh, tried to help um, with uh, two, let's say two, many more, but let's point out Mercosur, for example, which is, uh, includes the country in the southern part and its relation with the European Union. Um, and another part of the continent would be Central America and uh, trying that these five countries of Central America um, get closer. Well, these are examples of how um, relatively small groups of country can um, create unions between them and then be more uh, ambitious and, and uh, in the future become uh, stronger organizations. Uh, in other areas of the world, the, um, in the Pacific, Asia, uh, they are doing the, the same thing. Uh, organize, organizing themselves and, and, and creating these organizations. I believe they are the future. Uh, I am convinced uh, Spain is a country that has, um, uh, is a convinced, uh, convinced Europeist country because so many good things uh, happened in Spain after joining the European uh, market, uh, the European Union, we, we are convinced our, our level of development wouldn't have, wouldn't have been reached if we hadn't joined these two vital organizations, NATO on one side and the European Union on the other. And I believe 80-90% of the Spanish society is convinced about this um, movements against the European Union or movements against NATO in Spain today are really, really minoritary. So uh, I believe that multilateralism, not only uh, I believe it, but all the governments in Spain, since uh, democracy was installed, uh, have been convinced that multilateralism is the way to follow. Thank you, Ambassador, so much for your, for your wonderful 
insights with that and and just being conscious of time it looks like that's all we have time for today unfortunately but we would like to convey our sincerest thanks to you and Bass for agreeing to have this conversation with us and for your for your, all your thoughtful responses it was from a, from a personal level for me I, le- I definitely learned a lot about the the relationship between Canada and Spain the cultural um, uh, cultural connections we share and the importance of those cultural connections I actually had a few friends uh, when I was younger who actually visited Spain on that uh, the high school uh exchange trip that you mentioned earlier in your presentation so it's it's very interesting and very fun to sort of see the cultural connections and the importance of that in unifying our two countries uh with that i will now pass it over to vice president dr tina park uh for our closing remarks thank you eric on behalf of everyone at the nato association of canada i would like to thank our very distinguished ambassador for joining us today for a virtual journey to spain uh, for his time and candid insights as well as his tremendous service in advancing the relationship between Canada and Spain during these challenging times. And a big thank you to our audience for tuning in this morning from coast to coast in Canada. To learn more about the NATO Association, please visit our website and follow us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook to stay up to date on our uh, upcoming events. We hope to see you again soon, and thanks again for joining the conversation.